When Polestar announced their very first EV, this new Polestar 2, a lot of folks were hoping that this would be the first real direct competitor to the Model 3, because the price of this is certainly within the range of the Model 3, especially when you account for the federal tax credits that this is still eligible for and the Tesla is not. But some folks were disappointed by the range figures. According to the EPA, the range on the Polestar 2 is 233 miles. That's definitely less than the over 300 miles you can get in a current generation Tesla Model 3, even though the battery pack is about the same capacity. Now, part of that has to do with the efficiency of the vehicle. This is logically a little bit less efficient because it's a little bit less aerodynamic. Also, it's possible that Polestar is not allowing us to use as much of the battery as we get in the Model 3. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later this video. And perhaps most importantly, the Model 3 is a little bit lighter than the Polestar 2. So in this video, we're gonna be talking all about range and let's dive right into the range test for that. To make sure all the bases are covered, let's go over the vehicle settings now. I have the one pedal drive turned off. Personally, I'm not the biggest fan of one pedal driving, and that means that there is no lift off regeneration in the Polestar 2. Now, the important thing to keep in mind with the Polestar 2 versus the Tesla Model 3, or really any Tesla out there, is that this has blended braking. So even though regen is off in the Tesla sense of the word, if I press the brake pedal, it's gonna be regenerating power back into the battery. If you take a look at some of the shots of the instrument cluster, you'll notice that we have the power and charge gauge down there in the lower right side. Right now it says range 230 miles, battery is essentially full. On the left side we have charging, there's a hashed out portion, that's because the battery is not going to be able to do its maximum regen because the battery is essentially full, and then we have power over on the right side. But very different than a Tesla, if I put my foot on the brake pedal, you'll see that it's regenerating power back into the battery. That's because this doesn't just have throttle lift off regen. In a Model 3 or a Model Y or an X, etc., the only thing you have is what happens when you lift your foot off of the accelerator pedal. You have that lift off regen. When you put your foot on the brake pedal, there's no additional regenerative braking. The effect of that design choice with modern Teslas is that there are actually a decent number of EVs out there that can regen more power back into the battery than a modern Tesla. If you're moderate to mild braking in a Model 3 or a Model X, just lifting your foot off the brake pedal, then that's gonna be all regen braking. But the moment you start using the brake pedal, you're not using regen, you're using friction braking. With a few miles under our belt, let's talk about the way EPA range numbers are calculated. The first thing to keep in mind is that the EPA isn't doing these calculations. It's the vehicle manufacturer that does the testing. Now, the important part about that is that it's up to the manufacturer whether they choose to run the full suite of EPA tests in electric vehicles that tends to give you a higher fuel economy number, or whether they wanna just run the minimum number of tests that seems to give manufacturers a slightly lower fuel economy number. Exactly which manufacturers are running which tests isn't well known for all the EVs out there. Some of this is a little opaque, but we do know that Tesla tends to run all of the tests. They tend to be the most aggressive in trying to push the largest fuel economy or range number, whatever you want to take a look at there on those EVs. And so that gives them that over 300 mile range. Whereas some car companies like Porsche, for instance, they tend to be ultra conservative and then they elect a voluntary reduction factor to really drop that number down to what they think is a more realistic real world number. We see the same sort of thing in the Ford Mustang Mach-E. It's a little bit unclear what Polestar has done with the Polestar 2, but on the surface of things, it would appear that something along the lines of the Tesla Model 3 should give you 50% more electric range. The problem is when you take a look at some of the other ways that range and fuel economy can be tested around the world, for instance, the WLTP ratings. Now, the WLTP ratings are horribly optimistic, but the test cycle appears to be a little bit more comparable. But interestingly, when you take a look at some of the fuel economy tests around the world, for instance, WLTP, the range is an awful lot closer, and the Tesla still beats the Polestar 2, but only by about 18%. So it's an awful lot smaller of a margin than we see in the EPA ratings. And that simply has to do with the way these tests are done. Now the real question is, will that translate into a narrower gap in terms of real world economy for this Polestar 2 versus what we see in the Tesla Model 3. I've said this before, but in my testing, the Model 3's range seems to be optimistic. It definitely is in the exact same test that I'm putting this Polestar 2 through.
At this point in time, I've consumed about 11% of the battery, and it's probably time that we talk about something important. When a lot of folks think about EV range, they're thinking about wanting to do a road trip, drive from San Francisco Bay Area down to Los Angeles, something like that, or from New York down to Florida. And in that context, it's important to remember that for most EVs, your range is gonna be lower on the highway than it is in the city. That's an aerodynamic thing. Just going faster is gonna require more energy. So the faster you go, the more important that range figure could be. Since a lot of you complain that I don't drain the vehicle to absolute zero, let's go ahead and get close in this video. Now, after that test drive loop, which is of course what I use to test every EV and plug-in hybrid that we test here at Alex and Autos, so that way comparisons are as fair as possible, I then drove home in the vehicle. So if I take a look at this cluster right here, that's added a few miles. So now I'm at 123.6 miles, according to the instrument cluster here. Bearing in mind that most folks don't live in a mountainous area, obviously you'll be getting better fuel economy if you're driving this out on flat land. And in that particular driving cycle where you're going up and over the mountain, the curb weight of the Polestar 2 is a disadvantage for this vehicle versus something lighter like a Model 3. So let's go ahead and drain the battery. According to this, we have 90 miles left, and then I'm gonna get my hands on a DC fast charge station and see just how fast this battery will charge. And now we're out on the road. The first thing obviously I need to do is scout out the DZ fast charging station. I've never used this particular station before, so I'm just going to go ahead and do a drive-by and then we'll continue draining the battery. The Polestar 2 is theoretically capable of charging at 150 kilowatts. Now that is about 100 kilowatts slower than the fastest charging Teslas right now, or of course something like the Porsche Taycan, which will charge at around 260 kilowatts. On the other hand, most of the DC fast charge stations you'll find in the US at this point in time are around 50 to 80 kilowatts, somewhere in that neighborhood. We are seeing some development on CCS charging stations and charging connectors over time. Theoretically, the charge rates are gonna go much higher than we see in modern Teslas, but that rollout and that development seems to be taking a lot of time. Charging infrastructure is often cited as a reason to buy a modern Tesla. And that certainly is true, but there's a nuance to this argument that you need to be aware of. In terms of number of stations, CCS stations outnumber Tesla supercharger stations in the US, but they're located quite differently. CCS stations tend to be more clustered around urban and suburban areas, uh, parking lots of supermarkets, things like that. And they tend to have fewer plugs. So they tend to be one to three, sometimes five plugs in some of the major metro areas rather than the massive supercharging stations that we see over on the Tesla side. Also, other than Electrify America, there really isn't much of a DC fast charge infrastructure designed for interstate travel in the United States. So if you wanted to go from New York to California or New York to Florida, something like that, outside of those Electrify America stations, there aren't too many options. A few folks on our Facebook page were asking me about the speed that I was traveling and whether or not I would consider going a little bit slower since some EV shoppers out there might be interested in being a little bit more economical. So for this section of the test, I'm gonna go ahead and drop the speed down to about 68 miles an hour. That's just barely over the speed limit. I suspect that's the speed that a lot of folks will be traveling. And according to Waze, my true speed is 67 here. So that's just barely over the speed limit. Another frequent question I got was about the navigation system and how are the range estimates on it? It appears to be very realistic and perhaps a hair pessimistic actually. So far traveling to every destination that I've entered into the system, I've arrived with about 1% more battery power than the system expected. And what I did not expect was that it actually was pretty accurate about determining the state of charge when I got home, including going up and over that 2200 foot mountain pass. That did surprise me a little bit. 
The mapping system will also give you charging system availability, so you can hunt for charging stations and see how many of those sockets are actually available within the infotainment system. So in that respect, it is very Tesla-like and a little bit better than some of the mainstream EVs that we see currently in the US market. All right, so now that I know where the DC fast charge station is and I've confirmed that it actually is online, let's go ahead and uh, start driving somewhere random. I mean, again, keep the speed right around that same 68, uh, 69 miles an hour or so. Uh, and then I will just set this place as the destination of the nav system and drive until it says I have only the number of miles required to get right back here to the charging station. And we'll see how that works. Maybe I'll do a little bit of grocery shopping while we charge. After about an hour of driving around, I'm now at the point where simply getting back to that DC fast charging station is gonna get me basically to 4% battery according to the car right here. So very clearly, I'm gonna have to stop at a drive through get some lunch, and then just uh, chill out while I wait for the car to charge. Uh, based on what I'm seeing so far, let's talk about what the predicted range number is likely going to be. I'll go ahead and pull this up here. So we have 188 miles on the odometer right now. It's gonna be uh, 17 miles back to the location there. So that puts this in right around 200 miles of range. Now that's pretty logical because it is fairly cool outside. It's 60 degrees. Obviously, if you're living in New York through the snowmageddon that's going on right there, that's not cold at all. But I have been using the heater in here. So that is going to be consuming some of the energy. And again, going up and over that 2200 foot mountain pass has cut about 20 miles or so off the range. So in my estimation, 233 miles of EPA range range approximately is somewhat realistic in this car, but as with most EVs out there, your real world range will depend on a wide variety of factors, and I'm going to go ahead and at the moment put the real world range at around 220 miles in this vehicle so far. Uh, let's go ahead and get this all the way to the end and see how that pans out. One thing I noticed in the Polestar 2 is that at least for the moment in this infotainment system, we don't have quite as much information about where the energy is going from the battery. So you can see that we have this driver performance screen right here, and you can see that right now instant consumption is in the normal range, so is the average consumption. It's telling you kilowatt hours per 100 miles right there. But other than that, we don't get too much information out of the system. On the charge screen, you can see the battery's current state of charge right now. We're at 11% since we have 25 miles of range left but the car doesn't tell you how much energy was consumed for heating the cabin or cooling the cabin or conditioning the battery or some of those other uses that the battery obviously is doing for us as we're driving along for 200 miles or so. So we're now about uh, 2.7 miles away from the destination and we have finally received the little turtle icon there in the instrument cluster. Uh, we have 10 miles of range, six miles to go it says, and power has been reduced a little bit here. Uh, it still feels pretty peppy though I have to say, just not as peppy as you might hope. I'm actually going to go ahead and make a little bit of a detour here so we can get the battery charge down a little bit lower so I'm not going to get off on the exit that it's asking me to. I'm actually going to get off on a different exit and then go around a little bit in a little bit of city traffic. Fortunately, I can look up my fast charging station here. Oh, the fast charger I want is occupied. No, I'm going to have to charge at a slower rate or wait for that fast charge station to become available. Uh, so let's just hope that this information is a little bit out of date uh, or I might just have to wait there at the charging station a little bit longer.
With just one mile left to our destination, let's go ahead and check in on the range estimates here. So the car thinks it has about 10 miles of range left. We have 212.5 miles on the odometer. So that would be 200 and approximately 23 miles of total range in this battery using it all the way down to the end. That's pretty in line with Polestar's estimates of about 230 miles of EPA range. Keep in mind again that this included going up and over a 2200 foot mountain pass and parked a little bit for some photos. So it appears that Polestar is being a little bit pessimistic in their range, whereas some car companies out there are being a little bit optimistic. So it seems that in the real world with uh, speeds over 70 miles an hour, definite liberal use of the air conditioning and heater and some mountain passes, the 230 miles approximately of range is pretty realistic. You'll get a little bit less if you're going up and over those mountain passes or you're really traveling at higher speeds, 220, 200 miles, perhaps even as low as that. Uh, and maybe you could get a little bit more if you're being extra gentle on the throttle. Since I'm generally not one to push things too far, uh, uh-oh, we just got the dreaded empty battery plug-in vehicle message, although it still says we have nine miles of range left. So definitely enough time to grab a quick burger here uh, and uh, then eat it while I charge. Okay, so we're here now, we're here now. And the charging spot is available. Oh my God, there's a car pulling away. There's a car pulling away. It's ours, it's ours. Yes, yes. So I think it's on my side of the car. And uh, there we go. Now, the one problem, of course, with vehicles like this, and some Tesla fans will note this, is that there is one DC fast charge station at, uh, at uh, one plug, I should say, at this place that uh, can support the faster charge rates of this vehicle, just the one. So uh, that is definitely a bummer. And the charging has started. You can see right there that we are charging and we are in the 175 kilowatt connector. And then over here on the instrument cluster, it says that we are gaining range at uh, 176 miles per hour right now. And the charge will be complete uh, in uh, two hours and a half. After a quick 29 minute shopping trip, the battery has gone from 4% up to 67% there. So this is not quite as speedy as I would have liked. Uh, I'm not entirely clear whether this station is actually capable of delivering 150 kilowatts. It theoretically is rated for 175, but when I scroll back through the notes on this particular station in the EVgo app and the PlugShare app, it appears that some folks have said that they topped out at 100 kilowatts in some other vehicles that they've tried to plug in. So that could be part of the problem and that does appear to be about what the vehicle is accepting in is approximately 100 kilowatts. But with 150 miles of range according to the instrument cluster, this should definitely be enough to get me back home. <laughs> 